The heart of the demon city of Chaos Flame, the Crimson Lapis Castle, collapsed. Shadows overflowing. Some citizens stared bug-eyed, glaciated in place. Abel commands those around him to not stop, as if they delay in dealing with it, they shall all die. Vincent affirms, saying the number of victims could multiply. At the same time, they both turn and call upon Kafma. Stop that shadow. Know that the price of your procrastination is the lives of the people of the Empire. The moment he was presented with the action needed, his hesitation vanished. He leaps out the window, six transparent wings spread out from his back. Abel asks Vincent how many people he's brought, but he has nobody besides Olbart and Ubilk. Al is stuck repeating, why, 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 why at a time like this? Of all the people Abel had with him, Al was the one who had not shown his true depths. But given his terrified look, he was hesitant to include him now. Tarita, elsewhere, smells a change in the situation. That is when Ubilk approaches her saying the Mountain of the Fallen around her is quite the spectacle. He had somehow managed to evade her vigilance, and he assures her that he is just a regular guy passing through. She denies, though. He is far too calm. He says that this is a familiar sight back home, and he calls her by her name without ever hearing it. And then he refers to her as the disgrace of the Shudrock. Suddenly, her consciousness went blank, as she heard those words leave his lips. Why did he say those words? No, why does he know those words? Ubilk says it as a commandment. The stars aligned. It is destiny. Then putting his hand on his own chest, his eyes shooting through Tarita, he exclaims that it could be called a commandment for us. It felt like her world was quaking, but that was because the space around her was violently shaking from the disaster near her. My oh my, he says. This might be a small bit he did not gaze. Tarita expected this unconcerned man was responsible for the event, but he simply shrugs his shoulders. He knows it's awkward to mention immediately after mentioning a commandment, but this is the Kingdom of Lagunica's problem, and this is out of his responsibility. Perhaps she doesn't know she is a stargazer, he mutters. If that is the case, His Excellency made quite the daring gamble. She pins him to the wall, knife to his throat. Calmly and coolly, however, he tells her it is not worth it to spend time here, and that it isn't gazing, that this is just a hunch. The most discomfort she felt to the man was right at this very moment. The idea of slicing his head off flashed through her mind. Killing me won't make things better, he says, as if he could read her mind. It was the same last time around, no? Those few words were enough to stop her, throwing him to the street. Ubilk says she has a task to do. A commandment had already been handed down. Disgrace of the Shudrock. You're free to fulfill it or not. As someone who hasn't received one, he doesn't envy her for being able to follow that path. She wished that she had no idea what he was talking about, but she did. That idea had been plaguing her for the past few days. She didn't want to dwell on unfruitful anguish, as Medium calls her name. Abel had said that they needed Tarita's power to stop the shadow, as we cut back to the Crimson Lapis Castle, where Yorna just narrowly saves Louise from death. Subaru and Olbart were nowhere to be seen. Even Olbart, with his greed for life and keen sense of danger, could not avoid sacrificing his own arm. She is unsure of the state of Olbart's, but something else pings through her mind. The child. He would never make it out of here if he were the victim, but if he did this... Acknowledging that, there was a decision that had to be made. The duty of the Lord of the Demon City, the position that she must bear. That is when the shadow began to extend hands toward Yorna and Luis. It wasn't just one or two, but ten to even twenty plus came rushing to them. She established a touch would be fatal, as she dodges them in midair. She points towards the shadow, angry at it for consuming her love. A moment later, a strike came down within the huge shadow. She didn't know if it had substance, but she had landed a solid blow. The arms chasing them dissipate, as the residents of the city shout her name. Some of them are saved by Kafma, and Yorna looks down at Louise who is pointing towards a spot on the ground while groaning. She tells Kafma that she will leave this place to him for now, landing beside Abel, and referring to him as Your Excellency. Abel calls for a retreat and to abandon the city, permitting the shadow to consume it. Her gaze sharpens at him. She cannot possibly accept that opinion. Abel says that she holds worthless sentimentality, as he refers to the events in front of him as the Great Disaster something that endangers the Empire itself, and brings ruin that not even the light of the sun can reach. That was what the Stargazer spoke of. When he first heard it, he assessed it as an overstatement. Yorna feels bitterness towards the word Stargazer. The very existence of that occupation was one of the Velikan Empire's evil practices to her. It is very interesting that she feels this way about Stargazers, something that exists for the preservation of the Empire. Of course, her entire nature seems contradictory to Velikan ideals. Yorna has seen the plight of the oppressed, creating a safe haven for those with nowhere else to go, and the existence of the Stargazer implies that the stars had deemed the suffering necessary. Destined fate was to leave the downtrodden out to dry, and the position of the Stargazer seeks to keep the status quo. Luis tugs on Abel's sleeve, and that reminds him, he wants to check out on one thing. Where has that black-haired child gone? In response to Yorna's silent reply, he placed the last piece of the puzzle down. They will retreat. And upon muttering that, he gets gut-punched by Luis, who instantly teleports away. Yorna looks down at the kneeling Abel, asking if it would be possible to oppose it with the flame of the Yang Sword, but he says he has no intention of drawing the blade. How could this be, Yorna asks. With or without the Oni Mask, the man before her eyes did not bear the slightest resemblance to the man she had envisioned. If you do not flee, you will lose everything, he tells her. This city is her everything. 
As she pulls out her kisaru and blows smoke into the sky, it slowly falls down upon each of the residents, and she faintly murmurs, Love me. The citizens toss the smoke into their mouths. Their souls commence blazing, a communion of souls. She swings her kisaru in front of her, and all around the city, earth rumbling could be heard. Innumerable shoes, innumerable footsteps, and innumerable wills to fight. She leaps high into the air. The destination was the shadow of disaster. Manipulating the wreckage of the cityscape, she hammers a fierce attack on the great disaster. Surely, the enemy could not be immune to such an attack. Grinding his molars, Abel recalled the Stargazer, a convenient being who had foreseen the coming threat. Or should he be called a pawn of the observers? Medium and Tarita pull up behind Abel as Yorna hammers the disaster with buildings that the civilians are disassembling and firing. Tarita refers to it as the Great Disaster, and Abel asks how she obtained that name. Have the stars taught you how to escape annihilation, he asks? Only those who knew of its existence could rightfully call it the Great Disaster. She almost collapses as her heart pounds. She believed that she could hide it all along. She thought that she could remain silent forever. Back in the forest, she had failed to kill him with the arrow. Shall she respond to the commandment above from this moment on? The one to become the new Stargazer. Al lies in the ruins of a house, unable to cover both of his ears due to his missing arm. The ground trembled. The air was terrified. The world was dying. Why? Why here, he shouts. The danger that this could happen, as long as he was working with Natsuki Suburu, was plenty. Not just a little, more than enough. Rather, the situation would not have occurred had he acted alongside anyone besides Natsuki Subaru. Even so, he could not leave him alone. Back then, Natsuki Subaru should not have given in. That is when Olbart appears, as he ruins his missing arm, but he still laughs. That is when we hear of a bleak, dark space. Swaying. Wandering. Being tossed about. Violated. It was as if his body had been separated from his torso. Everywhere was pitch black, leaving him to wonder why he was here. Nothing came to mind. There was no reason to be trapped here. I love you. Each time a thought of the sort flashed across his mind, a faint voice restrained him from thinking. Every time he heard that voice, the thoughts he had till that moment would reset to zero. Someone, could someone reach his hand? Was there someone who had treated him well? Based on that, for the sake of reaching that voice, Subaru extended his hand. Al, instead of joining the party, was crouching, holding his shaking head with the one hand. Albert is annoyed to find a child scared shitless on the ground, and Al hopefully looks up at him, asking if he is going to fight that thing. He of course tells him to not be stupid. He only came to get Vincent. He doesn't want to be here too long. So, you're running away, Al asks. What else can I do, he responds. Al shouts out that he has to protect the Emperor, but he stops that train of thought. Vincent acts on his own. He doesn't need Olbart. He looks over to the startled boy, saying he should run too. Al lowers the arm pressed to his ear. His heart was about to fracture, his mind was about to shatter, his soul was close to dispersing. He asks Olbart, That shadow has something to do with bro, doesn't it? Noticing the tone of Al's voice, Olbart gives him a low-sounding response. It came out of him. Al closes his eyes. He already knew. He knew that Subaru was at the center of everything. If Natsuki Subaru was there, Aldebron needed to follow him. Without opening his eyes, he addresses Olbart. You told me to live wiser, old man, but I don't agree. Your way of living isn't wise, it's cunning. I don't want to be a cunning adult. He slams his fist onto the floor, managing to stand on his crumbling legs. This ain't the time to sit around. I won't be able to look my parents in the face if I do. Olbart asks if he thinks he has a chance, but Al immediately responds, No fucking way. No one can win against that thing. Even if he tried 10,000 times, winning against it, only Natsuki Subaru can do that. Olbart refuses to lend a hand, but... He doesn't want it. Just turn him back. If you want time to run away, then he will make some. Give me my authority back, he demands. Olbart is shocked by Al's newfound determination, but he wants to hear one thing first. How do you intend to challenge an enemy you can't win against if you even try 10,000 times? A grin flashes across his face as he asks, but Al tells him to pipe down, shitty geezer. Aldebron won't do it, even if he has to go die a million times, as Olbart puts a hand on his chest. There is so much shit going on with Al, it's unbelievable. I want to stress, the narrator called him Aldebron, not me. That was not dramatic flair. I am led to believe the title of the story, The Day I Gave Up on Being a Following Star, is not actually in reference to his day with Lip, but the day where he decided to give up. We have no idea about his life before Geenenhive, but he had a path, a goal, a fate to fulfill that he allegedly failed, to the point where he has trauma over women with silver hair, where he damns himself to not being able to save her. Perhaps Aldebron was also asked to kill Satella, but he was unable. That failure is the day he etched into his heart to stop being Aldebron and to live on Geenenhive, even fighting back while Ubilk is attempting to reform the island, afraid of a status quo shakeup because he would rather live the life he currently has than lose it all. Al became complacent. He described himself as the picturesque conservative because he gave up. 
However, something inspired Al to leave Gienenhive. There was an inciting factor that we have no knowledge of that made Al want to walk the path of a following star once more. The guy who refused to be free when he helped Albart decided enough was enough one day. The day I gave up being a following star is not a reference to his day with Lip, it is a reference to the day that his determination is found. The determination to give up. In the words of Subaru himself, who also has the ability to loop, it's easier to think that there is something more you can do, and there is nothing harder than finally giving up. Subaru lost his mind after dying 10 or 20 times, but what about Al? A man who is willing to die a thousand or ten thousand or a million times to get what he desires. How much pain and suffering and how many pointless or countless dead ends would Aldebaran of all people have to encounter to decide that giving up in Gidenhive is his life. Something changed with Al that we haven't seen, something that re-sparked his determination to walk the path of a following star once again, to attend Priscilla's night tournament, to stand up for her against Lip, and to now bet everything on Subaru. Of course, Al isn't without his seemingly nefarious side. He killed the Council of Ten and Priscilla, he has a tumultuous history with Ram that even she is unaware of, and he had a phone with Regulus on speed dial. And now he is working overtime to make Subaru a hero. What is he cooking? It's a question that we always ask about him. We cut to Tarita, Abel, and Medium, of course, who has no idea what a stargazer is. The downfall of the Empire was foreseen. That is why Tarita wished to kill Abel in the jungle. Her cheeks tensed up, crossing her arms. The commandments are shared among fellow stargazers. It was to be expected that pursuers would come at him, and in addition, the opposition knew he would have to rely on the Shudrock. In all probability, there would be an assassin in the tribe. He obtained definitive proof when she targeted Natsuki Subaru, mistaking him for Abel. She had no way to deny it. She had no idea what he looked like, only that he had black hair and black eyes. For a pawn of the observers, her nature is far too honest. She accompanied him during Garal and Chaos Flame. Why then did you not follow the commandment? A stargazer's predestination is not something they can resist. If she did not obey that commandment, the great disaster would destroy the Empire. She couldn't find meaning to it. She didn't know he was the Emperor. That's because, to her, but before she could finish that sentence, a huge black arm appears, swinging from above in an attempt to grab all three of them. She grabs Medium and Abel, leaping backwards, being narrowly saved by Kafma. You saved me once more, Abel says. Once again, she goes against her commandment. In order to quell the disaster, Abel must lose his life. He then asks, the commandment she received, are you certain of it? If so, would that not be what you know as destruction? This is not the great disaster the Stargazers are familiar with. She has not obtained some knowledge, but perhaps another stargazer has. If this is not the disaster as told by the stars, then Abel will have this interloper disappear from the board. Medium grabs him trying to stop him, but he says it is clear what needs to be done. The disaster has a will. A clear, obvious human will. Earlier, it reached out. Tarita had sensed it as well. From the abhorrent jet black thing, there was something akin to a slight attachment. It reflects the will of the one struggling deep inside of it, seeking salvation. It lashed out not at buildings, but at humans. It reaches continually out to Luis and Yorna, so it is a given that there is no way the Shadow is fond of him. This disaster is Natsuki Subaru, so it is no wonder his will intervened. All along, Abel had regarded him as a man of numerous secrets. Even this was beyond his expectations. Medium says that she will go then, because she wants Subaru to find her. But he denies her will. In her condition, she will not be able to fulfill the role of a decoy. And that is when Al appears, completely grown as an adult, saying he will protect Medium. He exudes a fighting spirit so striking that it was almost too much to look at. Medium is happy to see him so big again, and asks if he is scared. Being scared is something that will continue for his entire life. Still, he knows what he must do. Abel refers to him as a trembling, shriveled abomination. Surely, Albart cannot inspire others, and Al agrees with that assessment. All Albart did was piss him off. He isn't going to waste his words convincing Abel that he is ready to fight. And when he asks Al what he plans to do, he only replies with these words. Trade secret. Abel turns to Tarita. If she targets his back, so be it but she will have to make a decision whether or not to follow the commandment by herself. Biting her lip with force, she casts her head downwards, while holding back the heat rising in her body. Amidst the demolished demon city, dominated only by the continued violent tremors and roars, she looked downwards. Similar to how, one certain day, she was swept away, ridiculed by the stars. Yorna cannot keep up these ineffective actions against the disaster for long. She curves her lips, objecting to the timidness in her own heart that appeared. This city belongs to Yorna, and those who lived in it were under her protection. The last stronghold with nowhere else to go. They could not lose it. Luis was leaping around the destroyed castle, dodging hundreds of hands, and Kafma was lending assistance by making vine structures for her to leap around on, and the civilians were doing their best to provide Yorna with the materials to attack. Soul Marriage had the disposition of favoring the weaker ones, a tool created to help the weak more than the strong, not a substitute for the strong to face the stronger. It seemed as if an endless amount of time had passed, but only a few minutes had gone by. 
With a vigorous call to arms, Medium and Al appear on the battlefield. The majority of the shadows lash out at Medium, as Yorna notes that Al is carrying his sword facing his neck. One wrong move, and he would chop his own head off. The same man calls to Medium, telling her to avoid the attack on her right, then step on the scaffold and jump. Precise instructions to avoid the hands, as if he had experienced this hundreds of times. This was the same scene Yorna had witnessed at the tower the previous day when messengers had partaken in a bout proposed by her. The masked man had escaped the crisis by directing his allies to take preventative measures against Kafma's thorns and Olbart's attacks. Other than that, Al seemingly had no special ability. Was it just tremendously good intuition? Abel appears again, asking if Yorna has cooled down enough to abandon the city. He also wishes to correct her mistake. This is not the last place people can rely on. She is the object that those weeping cling and rely on. The true symbol of Chaos Flame is Yorna Mishigure. That is when a violent boom erupts from the disaster, causing a fragment to hit Abel's face, ripping his Oni mask off of him. Blood trickling down his head, donning his true face, Vincent Valakia stares at her. The populace is foolish. If it does not hurt, they forget to resist. If they have no enemies, they do not even arm themselves. They know not how to unite without disaster, and they are so afraid of death that they have averted their eyes from it. And all for that, it is that weakness and foolishness that makes them, them. The Empire rules its populace by means of iron and blood, and in the Demon City, your way of being has served as guidance for the inhabitants' own. Consequently, for your sake, they shall endure hunger and the rain, and for the day when the sun shall rise again, and for the day their stomach shall be full, they choose to desire with you. Abandon the Demon City. Their destination is the same as yours, and the only place they can turn to is yourself. Is Abel, or Vincent Valakia, truly worthy of the throne per Valakian customs? You might remember that I have touched on this even back during EX4 and 5. The very fact that he let Priscilla live so he doesn't have to kill someone precious to him is by nature not the Valakian will. He used admittedly Valakian underhanded tactics and sacrificed one of his divine generals in order to achieve peace with Lagunica, and here with Yorna the intent is clear. The story even makes it so explicit that his literal mask falls off. You could argue he is arguing to save Yorna in self-interest, but I think Vincent's prior actions show that this is only partially self-interest. In the same chapter, Abel considers the human heart to be inconsequential, but as soon as his mask falls off for Vincent Valiki to speak out, he appeals to her heart. We then cut to Tarita being told by Marioli that she was chosen to be a stargazer. In this jungle, where lives began and ended, villagers were like family. Marioli was no exception. They were special friends, being born on the same day. Soul sisters who raised their birth cry in the same place. A belief of the Shudrock was that the souls of children born on the same day were connected. A connection that was stronger than one between one's mother and sisters. Marioli was gentle and calm, someone who blended well with Tarita's anxiety. She would confide in Marioli about Mizelda often. Any conflicts or embarrassing insecurities she had, she could naturally confide in Marioli. So, when Marioli wanted to do the same, Tarita was happy to listen. I have been chosen to be a stargazer. Tarita didn't understand. What are the heavens telling her? It's not the heavens, she would reply. It's the stars who tell us. They assign us a role to play. And then, one day, when Tarita and Mazala returned from the hunt, the girl would be singing a song unfamiliar to the village children. The people of Shudrock could be split into two roles, hunters and guardians, who would stay in the village, raise the children, and defend the settlement. Marioli was a guardian. Her hunting never improved, but she was an excellent cook and seamstress, and was a great vocalist. Tarita, on the other hand, was useless at most of a guardian's duties, and not good at singing. They were like two halves of one person. The camp picked up on the song they did not recognize, but only Tarita was fearful and apprehensive about the source of it. She would later refuse that the song was learned from the stars. She doesn't know the song personally, but another stargazer does. Her answer went beyond Tarita's fears. Marioli made a lonely face. After that, her stargazing honeymoon period continued. She would spend her days demonstrating unfamiliar knowledge, singing unfamiliar songs, telling unfamiliar stories, and fulfilling an unfamiliar commandment. This was a Marioli that Tarita did not know. There had never been a time in her life that she did not seek her advice on a decision. The same was true for Marioli, even regarding her daughter's name. Seemingly prioritizing something other than the people of the Shudrock, something aside from Tarita and her daughter, her life slowly and gradually became trapped by the stars, bound by the commandment. Someone, someone who was not a star, was placing wisdom in her. Suspecting this, she even attempted to pry about her surroundings. However, as a guardian, she never had the time or opportunity to gain knowledge of the outside world. It was really as if the stars were whispering to her. The stars that spoke to Marioli did not speak to Tarita, to whom she was connected to by soul. Give me my soul sister back, she says looking up towards the brightest star in the sky. They would refuse to acknowledge even Tarita's rebellious will. The stars did not speak. They did not hand down commandments. The current Marioli was antithetical to the teachings and the way of life of the people of Shudrock. She did not want her precious soul sister to be exiled. We then cut back to the disaster, as none of those who had steeled their hearts to face it had faltered. 
They had to be warriors. That meant they must possess the strength to fight. While Luis appeared young and frail, she was endeavoring her utmost to survive, but not for the city. She had no stake if this place stood or not. Medium wielding a barbarian sword with her small frame, Al holding a sword against his own neck, Kafma mobilizing all of his insects and the town's residents. They all held determination to not retreat against the great disaster equal to that of Luis. Al running across the battlefield uses debris as footing. Staring at the great disaster while issuing directions to all those around him, there was no way to erase the panic leaking from his body. The behavior of the disaster was, to put it simply, predictable. Had it been a living being, it would have learned, taken in how to react and changed the tide of battle. Yorna stomps, shattering the earth, and the billowing shockwave split the great disaster's body in twain. Of course, not long after, it reverts to its original state. That is when Yorna accepts it. She will stand down. She will allow this city to be swallowed up, and she will blow it up from the inside. If one castle isn't enough, then it's the matter of using the city. If that is not enough, she will be made empress and use the country. The nightmares Tarita had started on one chilling night, under a moon pale and freezing cold. The anguish continued to gnaw at her heart, unable to share it with any. What should I do, Marioli asks. She is a stargazer, and yet, what had come from her mouth were not merely her frail laments, but also fresh, red blood. Her body had not been healthy to begin with. She was also a guardian due to the frailness of her body. As a child, she was often bedridden due to illness. As she got older, and those bouts grew less common, everyone let their guard down. She kept puking up blood, her face white as a sheet. Zelda says that the rest depends on her willpower, telling Tarita to spend some time with her until her last. The duty of a soul sister. That felt just like a commandment. A commandment spoken to her by her big sister, no different to that of the heavens. Each of the Shudderock exchanged last words with her, and the one who would see her end with their own eyes would be none other than Tarita. Marielle's young daughter, who could still not comprehend what was going on, clutched her mother's hand and gently rubbed her own cheek against hers. She said goodnight to the little girl, as she turned to Tarita to cry out that she still hasn't fulfilled her commandment. What she was worried about was not looming death, nor the future of her child, but rather something incomprehensible like the whispers of the stars. Tarita yells at her. Nothing like a commandment exists. You are a Shudrock first and foremost, nothing more to it than that. What Marioli wants is meaning for having been born, but she had a daughter. She had Tarita, she had the tribe, and yet she desired meaning. In that very instant, she renounced the blood flowing through her, dismissing it as meaningless. I'm your soul sister. How could you even speak about the meaning of being born in front of me, Tarita cries out. She takes out her dagger, its tip pointed at Marioli's pale throat. She places her thin hand over Tarita's, pushing the blade down into her own neck. She tells her she has a role to play. After a thousand nights have passed, you'll come across a traveler. It is an ally of the great disaster that'll bring this land to ruin. So, you must kill them. A traveler with dark hair and dark eyes. Kill them. Stop the great disaster. That is my duty. As she sheds blood, she uses the last of her strength for this entreaty. And for the very first time, Tarita hated her. Just like that, her head slowly slumped. She runs out of the cabin to see a small figure standing before her, Yusakata, was staring at Tarita, who was soaked in her mother's blood. The great disaster rampages on. A bitter decision has been made about Chaos Flame. Yorna says if there is life, she will save it. As the area covered by the wave of destruction widened, the earth itself and the cityscape being gouged out, Yorna was astounded by the great efforts a certain person was undertaking to keep the casualties at a minimum. Al. He continues to give out commands to Medium, who obeys. They understood it well. This was a calamity that would continue on inexhaustibly. Were it to go unstopped, it would not swallow the city alone. Yorna looks over her shoulder at the figure of Abel, watching from far away, standing in the outer gardens of the city, a place that can no longer escape destruction. The man with his arms crossed did not waver. Perhaps his idea of seeing the conclusion with his very eyes was a way for the man to display humanity to Yorna, urging her to make a decision. That is when Luis makes a reckless decision, rushing into the shadow. As Kafma yells, she must be saved. Al can only think, shit, shit, shit. Yelling out, he will resent Subaru for this, as he starts running with vigor that did not betray the tone of his voice. His destination was Luis, and he yells that he could see through her. He wraps around her as if he knew how she would move, and snatches her body into an underarm carry. He bonks her on the back of her head with the hilt of his sword, making her go limp. Kafma then creates a path of vines for him to follow as Yorna thrusts her hands out. I do not love you. With those few words, unto the great disaster, Yorna's soul exploded. Its potency was as if the entire city had crashed down. Rocked by the shockwave, all that composed the demon city was broken, crushed, and obliterated. But it was still not enough. It had suffered a blow into which Yorna put her utmost, yet nevertheless, the presence of wriggling darkness remained on the opposite side of the smoke. The reason was simple. Something had acted faster than she did, as Tanza leapt out of the blown up inn's basement. Yutakata cried out that her mother stabbed herself with Tarita's hands. Killing their own kin disgraced their soul. 
Mazelda supports her sister, and the villagers did not conclude that the chieftain was merely trying to protect her. It was none other than Tarita herself, who did not see it as a mercy kill or putting herself out of misery. Without her imprudence, she would not have died in such a manner, and above all, a commandment. Until then, she had never explained a single thing about it. How many times had Marjorie's words, her kindness, been Tarita's salvation? She would not allow anyone to state her life was meaningless. Biting her teeth with force, she raised her eyes to the night sky. The sky replete of heavenly stars had not changed. They did not confer with Tarita. Of course not. The stars spoke not. Marioli's mind was trapped within a delusion. The stars. These stars. I wish they would shatter. When Tanza jumped out, all sound vanished from the world. In the face of the great disaster, imagining Marioli's bloodstained face made Tarita unable to move. Everyone carried out their role, leaving her worthless self behind. To stop the young girl would mean missing a golden opportunity to destroy the disaster, whose movements had been arrested by a single blow. She looked around herself, longing for the means to change the situation, for a chance to make a move. Only Tarita, who had hesitated to participate in the frantic offensive, was in possession of options at this point. And then, Abel, blood flowing from his Oni mask, silently pointed his finger towards the heavens. To look to the sky was not what he was conveying. Abel indicated the heavens, or rather, the stars, namely, the commandment. She was told to choose. Quietly and without hesitation, she drew an arrow and took aim. It was a hunting procedure she had repeated thousands upon thousands of times. It transformed her from a frightened, bewildered, and foolish girl who was unable to do her job into a hunter. All along, her answer to the proposition of the heavens, to the whispers of the stars, had long since been decided. In other words, I don't even know what sort of a thing a commandment is. The knocked arrow flew furiously through the air, cutting through the wind. It did not miss its mark, as Yorna fell to the ground now being unable to save Tanza. Disobeying the commandment entrusted to her soul sister, she allowed the young girl to achieve her greatest wish, pushing on to stake her life. That is when Tanza's body was swallowed up in the disaster, and then a monumental second shock. An extreme explosion comparable to the Demon City's own blew the great disaster away. The Tarita name chapter is a highlight of Arc 7, and probably stands as the top chapter of the arc thus far. There is an insane amount of stuff that can be pulled from this chapter. First and foremost, the position of Stargazer. We learn that you were indeed given a commandment, which in my previous phase video, I interpreted the observers as handing out instructions as light, and I think that this is still in line with what we learned here. There is also one thing that can be inferred here, that you were not born into the role of a Stargazer. It is something that is given to you, which leads me to my next point. Stride Valakia was a Stargazer. He wasn't deluded by poison or whatever. It was at that very moment that he was given the opportunity to commune with the stars. Marioli and Stride, two very obscure ReZero characters, actually have some parallels here. Marioli is someone who, upon becoming a stargazer, found a purpose in that. It could be equated to a spiritual experience for someone to hear the voices of the stars one day. She made her primary goal in life, her purpose, her reason to continue, the stars. She wanted to contribute to the grand mechanism of the world. Stride is someone who, upon becoming a stargazer, found a purpose in that. He made his primary goal in life, his purpose, the shattering of the stars. Where Marioli found confidence in the determinist outside of the world, Stride had detested it. They both had their life courses altered by becoming stargazers, but Stride was one of disdain for the wicked observers. That life-altering course affected the people around them in very different ways. Where Kurgan encouraged his son and was proud that he had challenged them, Tarita detested how Marioli felt she served no purpose outside of the stars, viewing her soul sister as abandoning the tribe, abandoning her daughter, and even abandoning her. Yet that commandment was something that ate away at her, and the only thing that she could think to do was to push destiny off of herself and onto Tarita. It leads one to believe, if Stride as a stargazer can dodge the will of the observers, and Marioli can push the burden to someone else effectively killing herself, just how powerful are the observers? Perhaps they are only as powerful as we'd let them be. Of course they have incredibly powerful tools like Volcanica or Ode Laguna, but on an interpersonal level, it is a very anti-determinist message of fuck fate and fuck the stars. Do not discard the meaning of the world around you to follow something that ultimately might not be able to impact you as much as you think. This is where Tarita comes in. When Arc 7 starts, she is timid and unconfident in herself socially. When she is made chieftain, she doesn't feel capable, and how could she be? She blamed herself for Marioli's death, and was now saddled with a commandment that she couldn't handle, leaving Tarita with no idea how, why, or who to execute. Interacting with nobody is what made life so easy for her, going off to hunt is where she was at peace, and weighing a commandment from the stars was something not on her plate. Thus, she goes to Chaos Flame to find her quality as a leader, and she finds it here. Her quality is what makes her most comfortable. To deny fate. To accept who she is, and that the whispering of the stars cannot change that. As she knocks her arrow. You could perhaps interpret Tarita hating Marioli looking for a purpose as a bit of projection. We know that she has or had a fierce inferiority complex towards Mazelda for being naturally better than her at everything. 
Perhaps she saw a bit of herself and her soul sister in her last moments as well, and it frustrated her. But this is a conclusion to her small arc here in Arc 7, rejecting who she isn't and accepting who she is, ultimately making a decision that will qualify her to be Chieftain. As Yorna lets go of the Demon City, something she loves and holds dear, Tarita lets go of the commandment from someone who was as close as one could be to her. This leaves us with the final part, the target. We're led to believe it is Abel or Subaru. However, I think Subaru is definitely not the target, because the observers would know of his looping, and would know that killing him would be a useless decision. For Abel, I would be more inclined to think that he could be the great disaster himself, which means he is probably ruled out of being the target. There is one character uh, that is left out of the conversation, and that is Aldebaran. The way he speaks about how he knew this would happen if he were accompanying Subaru is quite interesting, and he matches the physical characteristics of the commandment. Like Subaru, he could loop. However, if Al is killed while his guard is down and before his domain is set, then he dies for real. This part is speculation, but when uh, talking about how Tarita helped name you Takata, it made me think, I wonder if that was the last piece of Marioli before the stars took over. And then it made me think, perhaps the stars themselves are responsible for the names of the Saint Archbishops. Who knows, but let's get back to phase 5. Kafma damns himself for having to be saved by Tadza. Stumbling upon Alan Medium, he tells them he has no intention of fighting them right now. They cooperated this time, but vows if he comes across them on the battlefield again, he will not stay his hand. Yorna, standing alone on the top of a hill, is confronted by Abel once more. She tells him that her name was Tadza. She had made her an accessory from her dead sister's horn. Both her hairpins and Gazashi are tributes from her beloved children. The marks of children driven away from their homes. Children who have nothing. Some had removed their scales. Some had gathered feathers. Some had polished their horns and fangs, only to offer them to Yorna. Abel says that they could use the fortress city of Gara as a base, and along the way, seize other towns to add them to their banner. With the Demon City inhabitants, it is possible. Below, Yorna's loved ones were probing the broken city, gathering their lives. It was up to her to give them shelter and light the path towards tomorrow. Abel lets out a small snort at the sight of Tarita standing stock still. He tells her not to worry about shooting Yorna, she'll be fine by tomorrow. That wasn't it though. Was she right to decline the commandment? Abel says it's not in the scope of things he should speak of. Tarita asks if Abel plans on dragging the civilians into the fight, and he affirms. I wonder if they will obey though. Al suddenly chimes in. He quickly changes the subject from Yorna and Chaos Flame to something more important to him. Let's talk about Bro. Medium mutters, Subaru, where have you gone? The darkness came from Subaru. And that thought makes Tarita think, what if, what if she had to kill Subaru and not Abel? Was that why he was at the center? Abel says there is one thing they must unify their views on. Subaru's survival is not something you hold doubts on. Media proudly shouts, of course. Just as Tarita is about to say that she believes he's dead, Al cuts her off, saying he's alive. Words with fierce conviction. Abel asks, how could he be so sure? Plain and simple, because Natsuki Subaru is that kind of guy. Or rather, because the world hasn't been destroyed. That is my basis, he replies. Tarita, Medium, and Abel all could not stomach the clownish reasoning Al had given. As the party turns to head out, they spot Louise, who is hopelessly digging into the earth, her nails broken and bleeding and her dress covered in mud. Al could only fiddle with his helmet as she hopelessly digs for Subaru. To him, it does not leave a good taste. Abel tells the young Sid Archbishop that she could dig all she wants, she will not find him. And Medium asks him if he has a plan in mind. It is not something as proper as a search method. The original aim would not be to find someone who has disappeared, but to secure a pretext to stir trouble in the Imperial capital. If that plan works, you and this girl's wish may come true. After all, the whole empire shall search high and low for that one person. The plan is to spread the word that Vincent Velikia's illegitimate son is seeking his father's position. On the same day, at the same time, in a certain place, they forcibly pushed their soaking wet body up. This person was literally in a struggle for their life. They felt like they had been bitten over and over by large fish in the water. They felt like they had drowned, all the while tasting blood. They forced their body up onto the shore while coughing out water they had swallowed. This was tough. This was anguishing. They wished they could use both of their hands, but wrapped around their left arm, there was something they could never let go of. They had failed over and over to understand its identity. However, once they understood what it was, they absolutely could never release it. Though small in size, they were still heavy. The fact that the one doing the carrying was not in perfect condition was unfortunate. Even more so regarding her since she was wearing a kimono, and those had more cloth than the normal clothing, meaning which soak up more water. After putting the dear girl onto the shore, they hopelessly tried to grasp their way onto the sand, but their consciousness was fading. That would spell death. Someone, however, grabs onto their hand. Let's not have that. It'd be a tad shoddy if you died. Having gotten this chance, I'd rather kick things off in a dramatic fashion. Nice job swimming all the way here. Such a strange coincidence. Walking wherever the wind took me got me here. Real nice, isn't it? Don't you just get the feeling that a grand tale's gonna begin? That is when Natsuki Subaru's consciousness was lost without answering. A couple of things here. It is clear to me that Subaru and Tanza have washed up onto Ginenhive, and I'm very excited to see where that goes for the future. 
But more importantly, I think Tons of surviving is kind of goofy. It's not the idea of her surviving in itself that is bad, it's more so the way the situation was presented, with the dramatic flashbacks to her first meeting with Yorna, the high tension and emotions in the scene, and all for that to just sort of amount to nothing feels like a bait and switch. There's another fake out coming in this phase, but honestly, not as bad as this one. This was just really weird. Rem was taken back to Priscilla's occupied mansion in Garal, as we cut to what the fortified city has been doing during the destruction of Chaos Flame. Rem had only experienced existence for 20 days now, and all she had to gauge was the woman in front of her. Rem considered her a rational woman though. She had seized the largest mansion in the city, spending her days there. The original owners protested, but it was settled in the way of the Empire. Bloodshed. Even in front of Priscilla, Rem's gaze can't help but wander to the man in the corner of the room, Heinkel Estrella. She thought he was looking at her in some type of meaningful way, but he is just impressed that Rem could talk to Priscilla so boldly. Schultz excitedly calls Rem an ally, a notion that Heinkel quickly shoots down. Rem is quite the opposite. She is an ally of the enemy. Rem is taken aback by this accusation, but she lacked both the information and memories to fight back. Of course, that which contributed most to Rem's tenuous standing was him. His miasma made him untrustworthy. No, not just that. She considered the very foundation she stood on to be unstable. She wondered what relationship she had with Natsuki Subaru and the others. If she were unable to face it, her frozen time and halted feet could not move forward. Although Rem wanted to face Subaru in order to solidify her existence, in order to face him, she had to solidify her own existence. Priscilla points out that she seems to be in turmoil. Rem agrees. She is trying to put her advice into practice, but her conversations are so difficult to understand. The notion of giving advice to the enemy infuriates Heinkel as he stands up in rage that Priscilla would help someone who is directly opposing her. But she simply tells him to be silent. She had set her eyes on Rem as a whim. The same whim that picked up Schult off the street, the same whim that selected a clown as her knight, and the same whim that summoned him when bloodied from his fruitless labors. Rem butts in, asking why they are present in the room, and Priscilla says that now is about the time the others should be arriving in Chaos Flame. So if the enemy were to strike, it would be any moment now. When great things move, they move all at once, as if the quietness that had prevailed up to that point were a lie. It is as if by design, the blocks fall down. Rem asks what the plan is, and Priscilla responds that the fools known as Zakira and the Shudrock will handle that. In the meantime, she will take a bath. Rem was incapable of hiding her bewilderment. Shalt, however, acted instantly. Rem asks what she is thinking. Her skepticism is a sign of her preconceived notions. Do you regard me as this world's observers, who can manipulate every event at will? I do not wish for a world with such tedium. What is the point of facing tomorrow if everything that can happen is as written? Rem disagrees. Underlying all of her decisions was a chance to find the Rem that was lost. Priscilla enjoying things that did not follow her wishes was incomprehensible. That is when we see Rem helping Priscilla in the bath, only for it to be interrupted by Priscilla stepping out and looking to the sky. Rem, following Priscilla's finger, looked up into the deep blue void, and saw not just one black dot, or even two or three, but a large group that only seemingly continued to multiply. Body entirely wrapped by the azure sky, traveling through a grand space like they owned it, a swarm of flying dragons cut through the sky. A dragon shouts out, and the person agrees. Let us do our job, as the senile old man said. On the back of a flying dragon, the small figure expressed understanding. Sky blue hair that met at the shoulders and golden eyes that shined brightly. The florid dress that wrapped that small figure did not express in the slightest the ferociousness and savageness of that existence. Madeline Eschart narrowed her eyes, her cheeks contorting into a smile. The ninth of the nine divine generals was ordered to destroy the city. Looping back for a second, I think Arc 7 Rem is already more interesting to me than Rem with her memories. You might remember from my Arc 6 Phase 5 video that I talked about Subaru and Rem sort of entering a role reversal to Subaru and Nubaru in Arc 6. Rem will have intense expectations on her shoulders and not sure what identity truly means, and she now carries the perception of identity that Subaru ascribed to her, and Subaru at times knowingly subjects her to those expectations, but considering Arc 6, he does try to not do that to her. He is very conscious of the dire straits she is in and doesn't want her to feel that pressure. As the dragons loom, Schultz walks down a roadway, attacking himself for being a useless existence, and he thinks back to Ye, one of Priscilla's previous servants. Al had told him that she quit her job due to familial issues, and before he can continue on this train of thought, he bumps into Yuzakata and Flop. Flop asks why he's so down, and Schultz is amazed that he can tell he was feeling sad, but he doesn't want to interrupt their walk. He tells the boy to not worry, as every problem is important. Schultz asks how they became the great people they are today, and Yutakata says that she was born this way, and while her mom was dead, the Shudrock helped raise her. Flop says that his upbringing is similar. The people in his life had a massive influence on him. He grew up in bad circumstances, doing work for no pay and getting beat up at the end of the day. It was thanks to someone's help that they had escaped. Before he could continue to reminisce about his relationship with Medium, he notes that the sky feels dangerous. The city hall is already aware that this is the work of Madeline, as Heinkel jumps out the window running along the rooftops. He grits his teeth, slowly reaching for the sword at his waist. The sword bearing the name Astrea, he yells out. 
All of you could go to hell. With a howl of unbearable rage, his blade flashed out, and the thin neck of a flying dragon passed by spurted blood, splitting asunder. Flop peeks out of an alley, noting that while Subaru tried to keep damage to a minimum, the enemy seems to have no intention of doing so. Flying dragons are roaring by, dropping rocks from high in the sky. A primitive attack with such intense force that the stone buildings of Garal are no match for. Flop isn't sure which path to follow while securing Schultz and Yutakata's lives. As he ponders this, a civilian runs down the street screaming for help, only to be snatched by a flying dragon. The dragons had two roles, ones that dropped stones and those that attacked directly. Flop about to convey his plan gets stopped as a dragon lands with blood pouring down its body. Heinkel Estrella dismounts the dragon, and Schult gasps at the sight of the red-haired man. Flop says that they are looking for a hiding spot in a basement, hopefully around spices to drown out the dragon's sense of smell. He asks if Heinkel could guide them to safety. He, however, replies that he owes this city nothing. He won't let Schult die because Priscilla will be mad, but other than that, he has no intention of helping them. He's not a big shot, and neither is Flop. He needs to know his place. There's only so much you could do. Don't try to reach outside of that. You'll only make a fool of yourself. No one could be a sword. As he spat this out, he grabs Schultz's shoulder. He will take him to Priscilla. They could follow him if they want, but he won't protect them. Flop was hesitating, and that's when someone says, You're the one killing us dragons? Madeline and her Divine General presence appear within a flash. To atone, Heinkel will shed blood, she says. The line that no one could be a sword feels like a very obvious pointed comment towards Heinkel's father, Wilhelm Estrella. In the Willogy, Wilhelm is frequently described as a blade constantly being forged, and of course, the Wilhelm we know now is quite a different man. I feel like there's a lot more to get here from the sentence from Heinkel, but I might have to go back and read previous Heinkel or Wilhelm content to become firm on it. Perhaps it will allow some of you in the comments to dig into it, though. As soon as Flop saw this little girl, he knew she was bad news. Despite possessing no warrior's intuition, a siren blared in his head. Heinkel's eyes open wide, and Madeline asks if he is scared. His legs tremble, barely supporting his own weight. Having observed Heinkel's despair, Flop tries to speak with her. Her gaze alone would not kill him, but the oppressive sensation coming from it felt like it would. I'm Flop O'Connell, a humble merchant. I'm in a difficult and bewildering situation. You know more about it than I do, don't you? The only response he gets is being called collateral. Yutakata has an arrow aimed at Madeline. The distance between them was only 7 to 8 meters. Even with her inferior skills, she could land it. Madeline scans the group. Flop is a warrior. Schult is a warrior. Yutakata is a warrior. You, she then points at Heinkel, calling him a coward. Draw your sword, for I, the dragon, will strike you. For every drop of blood that has been shed. She begins to step towards him, so Yutakata releases her arrow, which she catches between her two fingers. She didn't even turn her head to look. Heinkel clears his throat, gripping his sword as tight as he can and swinging it at the child, only for the blade to fall out of his hand as he swings up. The metal of the blade colliding with the stone floor resonated through the fortified city, and alongside that echoing sign of defeat, Madeline affirms that he is no warrior. She punches him in his side, his body slamming into the stone building. That single hit caused his eyes to roll to the back of his head, as she hit him square in the face. The back of his head slammed against the wall, and she unleashes a flurry of blows into his torso. The house he rests on collapses thunderously, but before Heinkel can even land on the ground, she grabs his leg and throws him. The fallen Heinkel did not even twitch as he lay on the street. She looks down on him, calling him a wimp, unleashing a foldable, razor-sharp blade called a flying winged blade. A skillful user could throw it for dozens of meters, spinning the blade around and back to the user's hand. Devoid of mercy, she directed it at Heinkel laying on the ground. If he were struck, he would surely be dead. Flop asks for her to stop, telling her that he understands her rage. She was enraged that her companions had been felled by someone so insignificant. It was an insult to not only Heinkel, but the dragons he had slain. Schultz cries out to leave Heinkel alone, running in before his body could even think. But Madeline was not so merciful that she would hesitate for a child driving her blade directly into Schultz's head. Kuna and Holly come to see if Rem is okay during the assault, as she gives it her all to heal as many people as she can. It's revealed that Priscilla secured this mansion not just for her own pleasure, but also for its size and distinctiveness to send the wounded. That is when a dragon lands beside the building, as Priscilla steps off. Rem asks how her Yang Sword is doing, and she replies it has darkened. For now, it is merely a blunt object, as she thrusts it down the dragon's maw. Rem is worried for those who cannot fight, thinking of Schult, but Priscilla reassures her she will not let him die so easily. That is when we see the result of Madeline's allegedly decisive blow, as she asks, What are you? Gnashing his teeth, Schultz covered the fallen Heinkel. She looks back and forth between her weapon and the back of Schultz's head, once, twice, three times, four times, over and over again. In rapid succession, she hits Schultz, but he won't die. Schultz was entirely oblivious, blinking his eyes. Looking at Madeline's blade, he could see fire in his eyes, saying, It's not hot though. You can't possibly be related to that fox person, Madeline yells. She leaps above the street, crushing a building under her feet. She yells, you're in my way. In this dragon's way again. Be gone, you nuisance. She then swings her flying winged blade down to the ground. 
The blade was aimed to cleave Shulton too, and Flop thinks if he doesn't do something, Medium will be angry. He exposes himself to the blade, only for Priscilla herself to compliment him, blocking the winged blade and telling him to head to City Hall. She tells Flop to leave Heinkel behind, but he refuses, as Schultz went through hell to save him. The party flees while Priscilla stays behind, and in an instant, her hair ornament shatters. Madeline points out that even she won't die. People who won't die even when their hearts are crushed are annoying. In response, Priscilla looks towards the heavens for the Yang Sword, but it seems its sunlight has ceased, meaning that this will be more complicated than she had anticipated. Priscilla would dodge and weave through Madeline's intense blows, but without the light of the Yang Sword, each hit was a risk. As the sun could only shine for half of the day, it shared its responsibilities with the moon, using the time to build up its strength. If there was a sun that shone always, then that would be none other than Priscilla herself. To end this battle, Priscilla will need a decisive blow, and that is when steam begins to blow out of Madeline's nose. The dragon's blood circulated throughout her body, the rise in body temperature provoking steam to rise from her frame. Combined with the white breath, her figure seemed as though it were even enveloped in white smoke. Priscilla, in response, only says, Nay, how odd, she thinks. Madeline's budding emotions were causing the flying dragons to also become frantic, not to mention, it was not possible for snow. Slowly but surely, snow fell upon the fortress city. In Valachia, there were plenty of people who had never even seen snow, living in such a moderate nation. That is when a voice we have not heard in a long time echoes throughout the battlefield. That's enough. She's in a hurry, but she can't let this pass. The footsteps of a silver-haired young girl echoed. A witch, accompanied by snow, had come. Once Amelia had become aware of Subaru's location, she had made the biggest commotion of her life. Beatrice, clutching onto Amelia's hand, assures her group that no matter where Subaru is, they will get him no matter what. The fortress city of Garol was destroyed, but all Amelia could focus on was the crushing of lives. Just how could they do such terrible things? Even Amelia, who was sickened by the violent acts of the city, saw no way out of the situation than through violence itself. The air around her begins to cool, and white snowflakes fall from the sky, blanketing the city with a layer of frost. As she unleashes a move called Ice Age, she utilized the utmost care in ensuring this place would not end up like the Elior Forest, carefully tuning the amount of magic used. All she had to do was create an unbearable winter to lands unacquainted with the cold. Priscilla knows that the dragon kind were weak against the cold, as Madeline shouts out asking just who are these people, and Amelia introduces herself as Emily. Madeline calls her a half-devil, but Amelia is not thwarted. She demands that she call the dragons in the sky away from the city. Priscilla tells Amelia that Madeline is incapable of being persuaded, and Amelia forges her a new hairpin with ice. As fire and frost combine, the moon and the sun's lights intertwined. Madeline throws her winged blade at Amelia, only to have it reflected with a massive hammer of ice. Madeline then steps forward Forward, only for a block of ice, even larger than that of City Hall, to land on her small frame. The ice block trembles and cracks, as she breaks out with a thunderous roar. Amelia utilizes a set of ice footholds for Priscilla to climb up, and she closes the distance between her and Madeline with a sword of ice. The sword shatters on her body, and Madeline aims up at Priscilla, but Amelia's fighting style basically amounts to never not attacking, as she drop kicks Madeline. She charges in with dual ice swords, and before Madeline can even think, Priscilla and Amelia switch places, allowing Priscilla to beat Madeline with a dance of frost. The dragon was forced onto the defensive, as the duo dodges an attack that uses the last of her wrath. A sword strikes her horn, and an axe of frost hits her square in the chest. Priscilla, however, is not convinced that a Nine Divine General would be defeated so easily, but somehow, Amelia doesn't really know what a Divine General is? Seriously? Studying for the Royal Selection, you don't know what a Divine General is? Okay. A few things here. First of all, my initial interpretation of Madeline asking if Schultz was related to Yorna, I thought was like, you know, a way of asking if he knows her, you know, not like literal relation, but the more I thought about it while writing this script, I wonder if it's an implication that Priscilla and Yorna are related in some way. Not only that, but in Chaos Flame, Yorna would descend artificial stairs while Priscilla ascends artificial stairs made by Amelia. I'm definitely predicting a relation between those two, not sure what exactly, but I guess we'll find out eventually. Amelia goes to retrieve Madeline, but that is when she utters, Mazoria. That was when a bright white beam was fired from the heavens, as both of the candidates sprung into action. Priscilla drew upon the Yang Sword, the light inside being very feeble, and Amelia conjured a massive, multi-layered dome of ice. The beam hits the dome, and within a second, pierces the first layer, then the second, then the third. However, every time the beam pierced a layer of ice, the trajectory was shot slightly off, and after it had met the sixth dome, the beam would meet none other than the power of the Yang Sword. Shockwaves blew around the city, without mercy, without bias, the shockwave engulfed the entire city. Flop was thrown back against a wall, and he hears the pain-filled voice of Rem as she looks at a fallen figure outside of their building. Flop follows her as she rushes outside, and he notices the snow trickling down. Even in a dream, such a scene would be hard to materialize. Flop suddenly opens his eyes wide. The figure Rem was kneeling beside was a small one, possessing twin black horns on her head. She casually swings her arm adorned with sharp claws toward the woman trying to save her life, and Flop experiences the sensation of sound fading away. He empathized with her. She must have had a horrible experience. When he closed his eyes, he could see his little sister. 
at the back of his eyelids, smiling. He was proud of her, who had sworn herself that she would become so strong that her brother would never be hurt. Multiple figures, that of his benefactor and of his sworn brother, those who had given him and his sister the chance to go out into the world, passed through his mind. Treasure your life, Flop. Self-sacrifices for morons, his benefactor once said. I don't mind being called a moron, he mutters, taking the blow for Rem. Blood sprayed, and Flop O'Connell fell to the cold ground. So who's the next one, Madeline proudly yells out. She looked down at the man that had intervened to protect the blue-haired girl, but what she took notice of was not his pale skin covered in blood, but of something around his neck. A dragon fang dangles beneath his body. Rem's voice cracks at the scene. She immediately recognized that he had saved her, and it was the girl she tried to save that had done that to him. Madeline pushes Rem back down. Why? Why is Carillon's fang hanging from your neck? She asks Flop. Rem begs her to stop. He's unconscious. And she meets her eyes. And her spirit understood the intensity within them. Rem can heal him, and she tells her to do it quickly. She had already healed so many. Her entire body was overcome by a sense of fatigue. The painful wounds themselves were not which needed to be patched up. Rather, life itself. The very thing flowing out of Flop and in need of being preserved had to be contained. Healing magic was not solely about filling gouged flesh, sealing wounds, or relieving pain. Healing magic is magic that saves lives. To interfere with life itself. With a faint exhale, Flop spoke. Don't heal me fully. He falls unconscious again, and Rem is perplexed. That is when she remembered the figure behind her. Rem turns to the young girl, saying if you want her to continue healing, then she must call the dragons off of the city. With Flop's life as a bargaining chip, she could stop the attack. After a moment of silence, she tells her not to look down on this dragon, grabbing Rem by her pale throat. She felt the urge to beg for forgiveness, but she was reminded of Subaru, who stood in front of Rem to protect her from another enemy as strong as this one. In her eyes, Subaru was neither special, nor was he strong. Despite being frightened, he never backed down. Ever. He had never cast his gaze downwards. Even if you kill me, you'll lose. A threat Rem is barely able to form through her crushed throat. Amelia wakes up, her having fallen unconscious right in front of a giant fallen dragon. Priscilla, who looks more torn up and tired than she usually puts on, tells Amelia to stop. There has been a change in the situation. As the dragons in the sky begin to depart, Madeline has vanished, along with Flop and Rem. Flop's trusted benefactor all that time had been Miles. Life at the orphanage he lived at was better than he had prior. They were given blankets, though they were thin and tattered. Meals were provided, albeit considering of tasteless soup with a piece of bread. He could not bear to expose Medium and the other children to the punches and kicks of the adults. Thus, Flop learned how to act as cheerful as possible to draw attention. Even on the adults' worst days, it was Flop who stood out as he did, becoming their first target for abuse. Standing out was a weapon in its own right. He had shifted their anger from the young children to himself. It was there, on that night in which Medium had comforted his wounds, that he had become convinced this was the role he had to play. That is when Miles appeared at the orphanage, escorting the children out and rolling out the tied-up adults. He kicks them in the face, and he calls them vile ingrates. He looks towards Flop, asking if he wants to get even, a hundred times over. All of the children except for Flop became enraged renegades. The adults cried for them to stop. The children who clawed at their faces, slapped them on the cheeks, pissed on them, their pent-up anger exploding. Miles says that they should do as they like, but his countess would be mad if he abandoned them here, so he will escort them to Serena. Anxiety filled their faces, they were never presented with the option of options. On their way to Miles' master, Medium tells Flop goodnight. The view outside, devoid of the prison called Shelter. He no longer had to worry about being beaten. We cut to Zakir in the fortified city, looking for possible repairs in the heavily damaged city, but someone is told to drop their weapons. A prisoner that was released to fight the dragons. Zakir tells him he has no intention of returning him to jail so quickly. In fact, he's even free to go. Definitive rules and rewards like that are what Vlakia is based on. The man, however, asks how could he let him go after Zakir betrayed the Emperor, but of course, he replies he pledges full loyalty to Sir Vincent. If you put down your weapons, I will explain. Jamal Ariel was alive, and puts his weapons down to listen to Zakir, and at the same time, Otto enters City Hall, saying they wish to offer aid to their city. Serena tells the children that they are free to do as they please in her territory. Unlike Medium and the others, who were turned towards the fresh new world, Flop was impressed by a world and way of thinking he was unfamiliar with. He was influenced by the philosophies that Miles spoke of so casually. We're the same, aren't we? Someone says. A tall, older boy, around 12 to 13 with brown hair. He was sitting cross-legged with an egg in his lap. Flop asks what the boy is doing, and he says he is going to hatch it. That was the first encounter with the O'Connells, and Balroy, their sworn brother. Rem sits in a room, and an old man enters the room, the Prime Minister of the Vlakian Empire, Burstet's Fondelafon. Mm, unfortunate name. All Rem could think was that Abel and Subaru should be here, but perhaps his good Subaru isn't present. He would only act recklessly and harm himself. She asks if he knows that Abel is the real emperor, and he confirms. Allowing him to escape was a blunder. After that, things have been proceeding all according to plan. Or, they were. He does not seek individual personality in the emperor. Personal feelings and attachment are trivial, from the perspective of running a nation. She asks what Abel was lacking, and he replies, How many children do you think he has? None indeed. Therein lies the problem. 
But why is he telling her all this? Because she is an Oni with healing capabilities and he wants her on his side. He would like to converse with her longer, but he is a busy man. She looks out the window again. Located in the heart of the capital, would pain run through Subaru's heart when he learned Rem was gone? A pain in his heart, just like Rem's own, which felt like a blade piercing it. Flop wakes up in an unfamiliar room, and Madeline is by his bedside, pulling out the necklace he once wore. Karillin, where did you get this? Flop says that he was there when that dragon was born. He thought up its name with Miles and Balroy. It was proof of the bond with his sworn brother, his family. Madeline's lip begins to quiver. Flop makes assumptions, and he asks where she got his name. Perhaps she knew Balroy, having replaced him as the ninth. She expressed pain, and his chest hurt, hounding her. Why did you become a divine general, he asks. For revenge. Madeline's rage was so pure, he felt his body scorching in her presence. For Flop, revenge was his life goal, as he targeted the world, a world in which people were forced to make decisions against their will. She seeks revenge for Balroy, the man who was to be this dragon's mate. She will never forgive the man who killed her darling. He asks who killed him. If Medium were here, she would have embraced Madeline. She would have taught her how to cry, having cried for Balroy's death herself. She did not know how to grieve. She could only think of a single way. Rage. She squeezed her small hands, resolving to exact revenge. The one who caused Balroy's death was... Upon hearing that name, Flop closed his eyes. He surrendered himself to the darkness behind his eyelids. He could still recall the faces of those dear to him. Flop's eyes were lit, and his lips weaved words. Balroy's killer was Vincent Vallakia. The Chaos Flame half of this volume was incredible. Probably some of my favorite content of Arc 7, and somehow, it doesn't even really have Subaru in it. Tarita named is a highlight, with so much stuff to absorb from it, it is almost daunting from an analysis perspective. The Garol half, while less interesting, still had its highlights. Obviously, the two halves of the volumes were meant to parallel each other in many ways. Soul Marriage played a factor in both, both cities ended up destroyed, both cities had witches show up, and we dived extensively into the connections of siblings with Tarita, Mazelda, Marioli, Flap, Medium, Balroy, Miles. I think Flap and Tarita clearly foil each other in this in some way here. In Tarita's named we see her become set on who she wants to be, finding her own path as chieftain, and finding her comfort in the hunt, whereas Flop has the potential to be thrust into uncertainty, because the guy he has been working with for a few days, after adhering to being a sheep in the land of wolves, was responsible for the death of someone he considers a brother. Behind Flop's eyelids, he will be confronted with a different perspective on revenge. Where Flop tries to enact revenge on systems, Madeline wants to enact revenge on the individual level. Another cool thing about Flop is his recontextualization of Valakian will. Flop protects his loved ones with his own strength, his own method of being strong, and that is by taking the brunt on others' behalf. It's sort of a parallel to Subaru, who viewed himself only as an existence that can save others. Speaking of Subaru, I think the Garal half of this volume shows an important message. Subaru doesn't need to be present for everything at all times. It shows that his friends are capable of handling things on their own, and it makes the repeated message of not shouldering the burden that much more effective or potent because the story gives other characters the opportunity to shine or save the day. A closing note is that Amelia not knowing what a divine general is was unironically such a painful moment. Someone who has been studying extensively for the royal selection for over a year doesn't even know one of the most important parts of the rival nation structure the nation that has regularly antagonized your nation for like almost its entire existence. Amelia doesn't need to be hilariously dumb. But anyway, phase five, very good. I am weighing putting it above phase one, but we'll see. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the funny YouTube algorithm. You can check the description down below to follow me on Twitter where I'm objectively correct all the time. Uh, you can also join my Discord where we talk about My Hero Academia, ReZero, Jujutsu Kaisen, and stuff like that. And you can also now become a YouTube member, which basically just gives you access to behind the scenes content, a little badge on comments and live stream chats, and access to some emotes. Only do so if you want to support the channel though. But that's about it though. Thank you for watching. See ya.